And I would challenge you to challenge big philanthropy to make gap closing investments. Our job is to make sure that if true equity and representation and inclusion are going to be a part of what we stand for, that they do not just be simple statements, but they be hallmarks. Giving is relative to capacity. So what might be $1,000 for one person, maybe $100 is just as significant proportionate to their capacity. But I truly believe that we have a purpose here on earth and once we start to discover that from a place of giving, I really think that we find our calling and for me, that's what the Cleveland Foundation is about. Production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland which is devoted to conversations of consequence that help democracy thrive. It is Friday, April the 1st, and I'm Connie Hill Johnson, chair of the Cleveland Foundation Board of Directors and former co-chair of the Foundation's African American Philanthropy Committee. We are delighted to partner with the City Club of Cleveland to bring Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell, president of Spelman College, here to speak to us as part of the City Club's Education Innovation Series. And as we start, I'd like to offer a special welcome to new listeners here on 89.7 WKSU and WOVU 95.9 FM. Welcome. Historically, black colleges and universities, or HBCUs, have been educating black men and women for more than 100 years. HBCUs boast impressive indicators like high college graduation rates and college affordability, all pointing to the school's important role in supporting our country's leaders and scholars of color. HBCUs also play important roles in promoting access to civic engagement, period. Earlier this week, the City Club and the Ohio Debate Commission spent several days at Central State University for Ohio's Senate and gubernatorial primary debates. Central State University is Ohio's only publicly funded HBCU, and they are with us here in the audience today. Thank you to the staff and faculty at Central State for being such gracious hosts. In March of 2015, Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell was named the 10th president of Spelman College, an HBCU located in Atlanta and a global leader in the education of black women. Prior to this, Dr. Campbell dedicated many years of her career to the arts and culture sector, including the Studio Museum in Harlem at a time when the city of New York was on the verge of bankruptcy. Under Dr. Campbell's leadership, the museum became the country's first accredited black fine arts museum and a linchpin in the redevelopment of Harlem. She also spent time as New York City's Commissioner of Cultural Affairs under two mayors and as the dean of NYU's renowned Tisch School of the Arts. In 2009, President Barack Obama appointed Dr. Campbell to be vice chair of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities. Viewing Spelman as a necessity to reach an ideal of equality, Dr. Campbell recently launched Imagine, Invent, Ascend, the school's 2022 strategic plan. It is a bold new vision for Spelman that builds on the college's legendary legacy to educate black women for the 21st century. So what is next for Spelman College and the future of HBCUs? That's what we're here today to learn and discuss. 
Moderating the conversation today is Jenny Hamill, education reporter with 89.7 Idea Stream Public Media. If you have questions for President Campbell, you can text them to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet them at the City Club. City Club staff will try to work them in to the second half of the program. Members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming the president of Spelman College, Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell and Jenny Hamill. Thank you. Thank you, Hamill. Well, Dr. Campbell, I want to say what an honor and pleasure it is to be up on stage with you to be able to ask you some questions. I just want to ask the crowd, are there any Spelman graduates here with us? All right. Hey, Spelman. All right. Hello, my sisters. There we go. And graduates broadly of uh, HBCUs? Yeah. All right. Okay. Great. So we're in good company. There you go. All right. So President Campbell, let's start off. Uh, why don't you tell us about Spelman's evolution? How did it come into existence? And what do you think historically its impact has been, especially, you know, of women of African descent? Thank you. You know, we named our, um, our strategic vision, Imagine, Invent, Ascend, because we thought that it really captured the 141-year history of Spelman. And I say that because at the end of the Civil War, right, there were millions of emancipated slaves. And there were no schools, not, not no, a few schools, Cheney State, uh, what is now Cheney State University, Lincoln was an, another one. But that was about all, to really educate the, for a leadership uh, of these four million uh, recently freed slaves. And so in the late 19th century, that's when you see most historically, that when most historically black colleges came into existence. And Spelman was no different. And ours was um, marked by the, the um, insistence on the part of two white Baptist missionaries who were teachers in Salem, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. who were determined to set up a school exclusively for black women. Uh, so they came to Atlanta, they had $100 in their pocket, and somebody told them that there was a black um, pastor, Reverend Quarles, a Friendship Baptist Church, who would help them. Now it turns out that this black pastor actually nurtured about five schools in Atlanta, mm -hmm. including Morehouse and Atlanta University and Morris Brown and others. And he said to them, look, I don't have any money, but what I can give you is the basement of my church to start you out with a classroom. And so on April 11th, 1881, 10 women and one girl showed up for class uh, in this basement. And the basement had a coal stove, so there was sooty and was full of soot and they can barely breathe. But in a matter of months, they had 200. The wow. next year they had 500. Because the appetite then was to imagine that they could get enough education to read and write, to read their Bible and to write letters for their family. Mm -hmm. By the early 20th century, this is, was the Atlanta Baptist Female Seminary. By the uh, early 20th century, it was renamed Spelman Seminary, and it was renamed, and, and, and Cleveland plays a big role in Spelman's history. Because these two women came to Cleveland, to a church in Cleveland, to try to raise money for this new school. They're in the church, or they're, they're given their pitch, and in the audience is a man by the name of John D. Rockefeller and his wife, Laura Spellman Rockefeller. He gave $250. That was John Rockefeller's first philanthropic gift was Spellman College. Wow. They, um, they eventually invited him to come he purchased the land, there were some old Union barracks, he purchased the land that is still our Oval, our central campus, uh, ended up financing 
Rockefeller Hall, Rock, uh, la later his children, Rockefeller Fine Arts, several residence halls, our chapel, mm -hmm. just really enabled us to really anchor ourselves. And, and in honor, it was named Spelman College in 1924. So we, I didn't have any <laughs> idea about that, Ty. That's pretty amazing. And let me say this. The family remained on the board for 100 years. Wow. So it's one of those untold stories of what I call a coalition of the faithful. Sure. Where we come together, black people, white people, men, women, you know, young, old. I mean, so you have the investment from Rockefeller, which was now in, now, in today's dollars, um, tens of millions of dollars. Right. But you have contributions of $2. We, uh, there are notes in our archives of people saying, I just want to give this $2 to help this new school for black women. Right. And, and that's kind of where Spelman remains. It remains that broad coalition in support of black women. That's, that's incredible. What, over the last hundred years, I mean, what do you think the impact of HBCUs have been, not only on the students who attend, but kind of society at large? So we all know that um, the real shame of this country is that in the 20th century, at the end of Reconstruction, we enacted Jim Crow laws. And Jim Crow laws legislated absolute separatism between the races. Employment, schools, public facilities, everything that you could possibly um, imagine. Uh, and as a result of that, all of our none of our colleges and universities were open to African Americans. So the establishments of what were then called Negro colleges, mm -hmm. that's what W.B. Du Bois called them in, at the turn of the century, the establishment of these colleges uh, were absolutely necessary in order to educate the black middle class. So at Spelman in the early 20th century, that became teachers, mm -hmm. nurses, missionaries, later during the Depression, doctors, lawyers, and after the Civil Rights Movement, um, the faculty at Spelman decided, you know what? We're going to make ourselves the place that produces black women scientists. And if you look at the National Science Foundation statistics, what you will find as the top 20 producers of scientists in this country are HBCUs. Mm -hmm. Given the fact that our resources are a tiny fraction of what a place like Yale or Harvard or Cornell has, that's an astonishing fact. And so were it not for our HBCUs, this country would be mu much further behind in terms of creating um, the, the, a, a citizenry that is open and equal. So in, in many respects, they served as kind of an educational safe haven they for were. men and women of African-American descent. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned the STEM fields. Yes. And uh, here's the statistics. Bellman is the number one producer of black women who complete PhDs in STEM fields. So kudos for thank that. Thank you. Tell me more. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Somebody once um, looked at a group of Ivy League schools and added up all the black women graduates from, from a whole bunch of Ivy League schools, and we still exceeded that. That's amazing. What mm -hmm. do you attribute that to? Well, as I said, about 40 years ago, a um, black uh, mathematician, brilliant mathematician, uh, Etta Faulkner, decided that this is, we, can, we can be good at this. Mm -hmm. We can do this. And she went down to Washington. She got um, money from federal agencies when NASA was created. She got money from NASA, from NSF, from NIH. And, and, she, and she convinced faculty to come to Spelman and make the commitment. She had a huge summer program mm -hmm. where students could come and be immersed in, in what we expected of them so that when they started as first year students, they were ready to really excel. Um, and, and they prepared students to go to graduate school. I mean, they deliberately prepared them to go on and to be successful at graduate school. And so you can go, I recently went to Duke and met a, a, a black 
physicist who graduated from Spelman has her own research lab there and is doing advanced research in, in materials to develop solar panels. She was a product of that summer school and that program. Nice. Okay, so uh, science, Spelman has down. What are some other, you call them pride points, um, that you think, uh, what are these points of pride that you think kind of separate or, you know, uh, show how Spelman's doing in compared to other institutions of higher education? So one of, one of the really sad stories of higher education are the uh, six-year graduation rates for underrepresented minorities. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the graduation rates for white students or Asian students, it's you know 60, 70 percent. If you look at it for Latino and African Americans, and African Americans, by the way, are at the bottom of the rung, it's 45 percent. Mm. Right. Spelman College has a six-year graduation rate of 76 percent. Um, and we do that with a um, a population, we have, about, we have over 2,000 students, almost half of them are Pell eligible. So what it means to be Pell eligible, our Central State colleagues know what it means to be Pell eligible. It means your family makes $50,000 or less on average. Now you think of the, for us, the tuition at Spelman is something like uh, 44, tuition room and board is $44,000. Mm. And your family makes, it's impossible. Right, that, you, that's just, that is a huge barrier to overcome. Sure. So the fact that Spelman is able to achieve those graduation rates with that financial reality, I think speaks volumes to how much energy and effort we put into um, the success of every student who comes here. Are there additional supports that kind of are, are applied to these students to kind of make sure that graduation is, is the end goal and is achieved? So in the, in, in the past few years, we have, we have brought back more and more summer programs to, to expand those, um, to make sure that students are understanding what our expectations are, mm -hmm. particularly in, in math, science, and computer science. Um, so we, we've seen that as being a big boost for us. Uh, we understand, we've looked at statistics, we've done statistic, statistical analyses, and we've noticed that when students are in cohorts, mm -hmm. that is in smaller groups, they can support each other. Yeah. And if those groups start as first year and they continue, um, by the time they get to the junior, they may not rely on them as much, but they have gained you know, confidence by those, small, by those relationships. We have living learning communities for, uh, uh, for different groups. So um, we have the availability of tutors uh, freely available for math, for writing, for other, other disciplines. We actually have a whole student success office that helps students um, develop uh, personal study skills. Uh, during the pandemic, we experimented with assigning upperclassmen students who were doing very well to about five first-year students um, and having weekly study groups. And what we learned is those students who went to all of their weekly study groups had demonstrably higher wow. GPAs than those who did not. Right. So we are always looking for those strategies of using our students' um, intellectual capacity to help each other and for us to understand how to organize our students in ways that, that uh, in, enables them to draw strength from each other. Yeah, because I can imagine as a younger adult, it's, it's easy, uh, I can remember from my college experience, to, to feel lost in the yes, ether. Yes, that's right. And when there are impediments like a pandemic or whatever it is, or you have a financial burden or something going on at home, those obstructions that's right. you know, sometimes may feel insurmountable, but if you have community, and those types of things that could be the change it's maker. A, it's helpful. Yeah. So let's talk about your strategic plan and what initiatives are in them that kind of um, really tell the story of where Spelman would like to see itself in the future and what direction the college is going in. So our number one priority for our, our um, strategic plan was to make the college affordable. And of course, that, that means first, first and foremost, get more financial aid. And we increase financial aid during our capital campaign. It's 
uh, we're, in, we're in the fifth year of our, uh, our campaign. We've increased financial aid by 325%. We increased full scholarships by 120%. So, so that's a first step. But we're also trying to lower the cost, and we use the pandemic to help us get there. So um, in 2020, which was the worst year of the pandemic, sure. we reduced um, tuition and fees by 14% with the help of, the stim of stimulus money. That kept students in, in, in school. They, could stay, they, could, they didn't have to pay room and board, right? Plus the tuition is discounted. They could hang on, right? Then when they came back to campus, we rolled the tuition back to 2017 rates. And so, and we committed ourselves to uh, increase, modest increases. So in addition to stimulus, you're asking how in the world do you do that, right? So what we did at the same time is we launched something called eSpelling, which is an online platform for adult learners. Hmm. And the, um, as we look at shifting the business model, our goal is to increase revenues from East Spelman so that we can keep our tuition moderate, mm -hmm. right? And so that's the, that's the whole, that was part of the whole Keep Spelman Affordable mm -hmm. plan. And we'll, we'll continue to do that. We'll continue to raise more um, scholarship money, grow e Spelman, but the goal is d d don't raise tuition on when you have 50% of your population yeah. is, is Pell, right? That, that's not logical, right? And your enrollment numbers and application numbers are showing. I mean, it's super, <laughs> why don't you throw out what, what the application numbers were uh, this past year? Yes, that, that caught us by surprise. So, so I, I would say in 2015, we had about 5,000 applicants a year, which is a good number because we ultimately want to enroll about 500 students. Five, five, 550, I think, is the number. Um, we reached 9,000 um, somewhere around 2017. We thought, wow, this is amazing. And then a year later, it went up to 11,000. And this year, it was 13,600 applications. They want in. <laughs> But the real surprise was in the yield. And so, you know, you, you do all kinds of algorithms and, and calculations to project what, if you accept X number of students, then Y number of students are going to accept your acceptance, right? So um, our yield was pretty steady. It was actually kind of slipping a little, a little bit. And we calculated, we actually accepted less a lesser percentage than we usually accept. And out of the blue, the yield went through the roof. Mm -hmm. And we ended up with 800 first year students instead of the 550 that we usually yeah. are, are looking for. So, so thank you for the applause. But I will tell you, when you have a housing shortage, it doesn't feel <laughs> so good. <laughs> so, so, um, so, so we're, we're um, we, that tells us that all of the things that we're doing are working. Now we have to refine, refine those numbers and refine it and get, get the population back to the 2050 that we think is the right. population that should be Spelman College. Okay, when it comes to Spelman, HBCUs, and, and just broadly, what more can be done to aid in the education and success of black women in this country? So it's, it's, it's interesting you should ask that because yesterday um, a whole group of HBCU presidents had conversations throughout the day with Congresswoman Alma Adams, who, by the way, is a super champion of uh, HBCUs, uh, Speaker Pelosi, mm -hmm. and also the Congresswoman who's in charge of uh, appropriations. And the theme that resonated over and over and over again is that we need major investment in our physical facility. Mm -hmm. And what I tell people is people say, oh, well, you know, we'll give scholarships and some, you know, the facilities will be fine. No, they won't. You cannot teach cybersecurity with a typewriter, right? right? You have to, given 21st century technology, you have to have modernized technology, networks, 
data warehouse, fiber optic, you, you have to be there. Otherwise, we're whistling Dixie, right? right? We're, and we'll, we will remain academically at the fringe. So it is really important that this country make major capital investments um, in our schools. And it is important, I, I think one of the great things about uh, President Biden's budget is he's adding um, money to Pell Grants. And with the increase that has already been allocated, if, if it goes, if it passes, it'll be a $2,000 increase in Pell Grants. I mean, it's the most, it's the first major increase in Pell Grants we've had in decades. So, so and, and, and I say this to re and remind people that um, my, 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 my father, uh, you know, served in the Army during World War II. He came out and he went to law school on the GI Bill. Tens of th hundreds of thousands of Americans got a college education on the GI Bill. When this country wants to invest in education, we know how to do it. We can do it. And we created the middle class in general in the United States. So there's no reason now why we can't do something comparable for our communities um, today. And so I, I think that this is probably one of the most important parts of Biden's budget, that he has made this statement and made it in such an emphatic way. What role do you think philanthropy um, plays in all of this? I think there's nothing more powerful than private-public partnerships. Um, and uh, we, we it, very often when we get a, um, an investment from NSF or from NIH or one of the other agencies, we very often will go to a private entity and say, we have, the found, we have this foundational gift and, and, and we can partner uh, with this. And it, it allows us to, to grow in, a, in an exponential way as opposed to an incremental way. And I think that, that's a wonderful way for philanthropy, philanthropy to begin to think about how it can partner, whether it's a federal funds or state funds or even local funds, how, how you can get more for your money by, mm -hmm. by really leveraging some of these investments. So I'm the education reporter for the NPR affiliate here. And obviously, um, you know, I, I report on everything from the toddlers up to, to mm -hmm. college and grad school. Um, it's obvious how important it is to get to the to the young kids and start, you know, ingraining in their heads um, that they can have a great future, that they need to apply themselves and all of those things. So how does Spelman College kind of implement any sort of outreach with the K through 12 schools um, and just trying to reach out to the younger children? So when I first came to Spelman, I, I, I wanted to get to know the Atlanta community. So I invited all the principals of the schools that were in our district. And there were two elementary, three middle schools, and one high school. And the principals all came to dinner at the president's residence, and we were chatting. And at the end of dinner, I said to them, so how can Spellman be helpful to a person, elementary, middle school, and high school? They said, teach our children to read. Mm. You could have blown me away. And I, 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 I was so stunned by that. I went back to our, we have a great Department of Education. And we have a family uh, literacy expert who's a faculty member there. And they worked with our Bonner program, which is our community service program. And they put together something called Spell Reads. And that is where they invited Spellman students to come in and be trained in literacy. And about 150 students showed up when we put out the call. And we ultimately sent about, I don't know, 120 into the schools. And they would meet regularly uh, after school to tutor students who had the most serious reading problems in fifth, sixth, and seventh grades. Their, re their reading analysts, not ours, their reading analysts came back to our board of trustees uh, three years later and said they, they uh, witnessed increases anywhere from 9% to 17% to 21% in the reading skills of students. We just got an earmark from um, Senator uh, Warnock in Georgia to be able to continue that 
uh, into the, the next couple of years. And we have added to that a new program called Math Corps. And that's one of our faculty members um, went to school in Wayne State 20 years ago. And they started something called Math Corps where outstanding um, college students in math train high school students to train middle school students. Mm -hmm. That's during the summer, an immersive summer, like six, eight week program. And then during the school year, they have Saturday sessions where um, they, they, they brush up on their skills so they don't lose what they learn during, during the summer. So this faculty member is bringing Math Corps to, to Spelman, and that will teach, that will also address math proficiency to about 80 to 100 um, students uh, in, from middle school up to, to high school using the intellectual capital. What I love right. about both these programs, it uses the intellectual capital of our students, and it uses their emotional commitment and their commitment to service and their purposefulness um, in, in a way that goes beyond financial commitment. Right? Although it does take money to do them. Um, sure. uh, and and, and we, we compensate, I mean, not a lot, but you know, we, we give the students something for, you know, for their, their effort and they're so proud. They're so proud of what they have accomplished with, uh, with, with their elementary school students. So now, we're up to about 200 students, and I'm thinking, well, why don't we do this throughout the AUC? Why don't we do this throughout yeah. Georgia? I mean, why, why not? Why not harness this resource of our students to invest in the next generation of K through 12? Yeah, absolutely. All right, I think I have time for one last question before I turn it over to the audience. So um, I was looking at you know, your, your, your pride points and you have amazing relationships with other schools. Mm -hmm. So Harvard, MIT, UCLA, and then there's just a slate of amazing businesses that are mm -hmm. providing internship opportunities. So obviously um, you understand the power of collaboration with these different uh, institutions and companies. How important is that when it comes to kind of carving out the success of Spelman students beyond graduation? So I, I look at that as having the best of both worlds. So I can come to an HBCU, I can be there, that's, that's, that's my community, that's my home. But I also will have access to the absolute top research. We're not a research institution, we're a liberal arts college. I can have access to the resources of the top research one either universities or research institutes. The collaboration with MIT and Harvard is actually the Broad Institute, which is MIT and Harvard's Biomedical Institute, mm. right? Um, with the um, Perelman School of Medicine. I can, I can go and I can do post-baccalaureate work in their research laboratories. I can partner with IBM. IBM is, is the leader in quantum computing. I can spend three summers there and walk into a job when I leave Spelman College ready to enter the field of quantum computing. So these fields which are the cutting edge, which are the future, uh, AI, machine learning, quantum computing, um, cybersecurity, areas of biomedical research, all of these, we have a huge health science careers program. All of these, we try to, to give our students pathways Law school, we have a number of law schools that now have pathways uh, with Morehouse School of Medicine, a neuroscience program. I can walk into Spelman and I can look around and I can say, okay, this is the path I wanna go on. And I can change my mind. Mm -hmm. And I can say, well, no, actually I wanna go on this path. And it's okay. And so it gives our students the safety and comfort of home and the ability to go out and explore the rest of the world. They can take their steps, right. maybe make a misstep, or right. learn from it, and then carve out a new path. Okay, we're about to begin the audience Q&A. For those in our live stream and radio audience at 89.7 WKSU and WOVU 95.9 FM, I'm Jenny Hamill, education reporter with WKSU Idea Stream Public Media. Mm -hmm. I've been moderating today's conversation with Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell, president of Spelman College, an HBCU located in Atlanta. 
We welcome questions from anyone, everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and or those joining via our live stream at cityclub.org or radio broadcast. Remember, if you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club. You can also text them at 330-541-5794. That, once again, is 330-541-5794, and our staff will work to get it into the program. So may we have the first question, please? Hi, C.S. Bellman alumna. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Campbell. So I'm Allison Graves Calhoun, a proud class of 1990s Spelman alumna, and I live here in Cleveland, obviously. And I'm also a Spelman parent um, of a daughter who's a junior. Um, I noticed your sweater, Dr. Campbell, and I wondered if you could talk a little <laughs> bit about um, the recent partnership with Ralph Lauren and the impact of those types of partnerships for our students. Thank you. And thank you, Allison, for everything that you do for Spelman College. He's also part of our 25. At 25, uh, our alums are dynamic. I mean, um, that, that's the other part of the college that uh, we count on. They mentor, they, we have formal mentoring programs. Um, they come up and teach history and tradition. They're present on the campus, uh, and they raise money for us. Uh, in ways that are extremely meaningful. So, thank you. So, Ralph Lauren. Um, yeah, I, that deserves an applause. I agree. I agree. So, when, when this project was brought to me, I was extremely skeptical. Um, I don't mind saying that, um, in my view, Ralph Lauren is probably the waspiest designer <laughs> line of clothes I've ever seen, and their whole <laughs> presentation is, and, and, and I, that's, not a, that, you know, that's not a revelation to anybody, right? That's, that's pretty com, com, common knowledge. But when I learned more about it, I was very struck by why they were doing it. And it turns out that during um, the summer of 2020, our racial, national racial reckoning, um, one of their black designers, who is a Morehouse alumnus, said to Mr. Lauren, I don't see a place for myself here. And, and um, Mr. Lauren was very taken aback. And he basically asked him, what would it take for you to see yourself reflected in this company? And the Morehouse alumnus, uh, James Jeter, uh, partnered with a Spelman alumna, uh, Dara Douglas, and they came up with this project. So this was conceived by a Spelman, a Spelman alumna and a Morehouse alumnus. And that project was, let's go back into the archives. So this is an archival project. Let's look at the photographs of what our students wore, and let's celebrate the way they used style and dress to express themselves, and later in the Civil Rights Movement, actually used it as a tactic to, uh, uh, frankly, to uh, integrate lunch counters throughout the South. And they, they looked at, at, at the era from the 1920s, 1950s, and early 1960s. And I mean, these photographs are breathtaking of, of the men and the women. And they, they desi the designs were based on those photographic images. In terms of uh, deciding on how they were going to photograph it, they chose mo models who were alums and students and faculty from the two schools. So if you see these, these gorgeous men and women, there are students and faculty and alums. Uh, and they are who, gorgeous. <laughs> who, who, who are represented, and, they, and, they and it was a black woman who shot the, nice. uh, the, the presentation, and they made a 30-minute film uh, and, and you can get it, you can go online and, and, and take a look at it. The director was black, the cinematographer was, was black. An entire black creative team made this. And they, they, it just took my breath away. I, I just, I, I wasn't expecting them to represent us so honestly and so with such complexity and with such beauty. And they did. And so, um, and, and, the, 
uh, Spelman alumna ended up getting a, a promotion, yay, Dara. Um, so it was great for her career. But it also, it also spoke to the fashion industry. It said something to the fashion industry. Give, give, us, give our young creatives some space, and they will, they will contribute to your success. Um, the other part of it, it was, was financial. We had a licensing agreement, so they had to pay for any use of our name or any of our Im images or symbols. And we got a percentage of the sales. And it turns out, when it went online in the first three hours, it sold out online. Nice. And on the, the day it opened in the stores, it sold out in all the stores in Atlanta, Los Angeles, and New York, right? So it was, and we got, a, got um, scholarships, uh, not only for us, but several other HBCUs. Wow. And they will offer internships for students to, who are interested in going into the fashion industry. This was a spectacular win-win-win situation for us. And, and, and if you listen to uh, Mr. Loren um, speak on the film, he makes a very honest statement. He said, I did not know about HBCUs. He said, this opened my eyes to the fact that this is a fundamental part of American culture. And if I represent myself as being the, you know, the fashion designer of America, I cannot do it honestly unless I include them. And so I, th I, 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 I thought we all came out of that learning something. I s learned not to be so skeptical. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, but, but also what it really, the kind of commitment it really takes to begin to open up this country. And I love that it was an employee who was a former student who right. spoke up. That was right. the impetus for all of it. Yeah. So. All right, do we have our next question? So I'm a current senior in Shaker Heights, and I plan on going into the field of education. And um, I had the opportunity earlier this uh, school year to attend an educational visioning workshop with Dr. Frank Locker. And since then, I've heard a lot of opinions and um, definitions of 21st century uh, education. And I know that you said we can't really foster that environment with outdated facilities and resources. So I was wondering, what does 21st century education really look like and feel like to you, and how is Spelman uh, making sure they foster that environment? So when you say 21st century education, are you referring to K through 12, or are you referring to higher education? For higher education. For higher education. So one of the things that was part of our strategic plan that I didn't mention is that we had as one of our goals promote academic innovation. So what that means is that you cannot rely on the status quo. Uh, you cannot say, well, we've taught this for the past 20 years, so we're going to keep, uh, keep teaching this. So we have systematically been adding to our curriculum in ways that move us into the 21st century. So the entire um, Atlanta University Center put together a data science initiative. Why? Because data and the handling of data, access to it, the analytics for it, the visualization of it, is going to be a part of, of virtually every field. And so we're, we're establishing a minor so that if I'm a history major, I can, I can minor in, in data science. If I'm an art history major, I can do the, do the same. Um, so, so that is one example. Um, another e example is the partnership with IBM. Quantum computing is going to be huge. They're the leaders. So our partnership now is a five-year partnership where not only our students will be introduced to uh, learning about quantum computing, but our faculty and our physics and, com and computer science departments will also get seminars on computer science. The Department of Defense named us a center of excellence for minority women in STEM. What did we do with that? We introduced AI and machine learning at the Army Research Lab. So we had faculty who could spend the summer at the Army Research Lab 
getting a grasp of AI and machine learning and begin to add that into their work, their, their toolbox and their teaching, as well as sending students to be part of that, um, uh, of, of that um, training opportunity. Um, all these partnerships that we're talking about, the biomedical piece, all of that is finding the places that will take our curriculum forward. We have to, and we have, to, and it doesn't stop, right? Because the growth doesn't stop. So, so we have to be vigilant as educators to make sure that we're not comfortable with the status quo, that we're always keeping our curriculum, keeping our students, keeping their experiences, their internships, their research opportunities at the cutting edge. Thank you. Sure. Our next question is a text question. In early 2020, Cleveland was ranked last as a livable city for black women. In response, a recent report was released in Cleveland called Project Noir that studied survey responses from black women in the city. They found severe, severe disparities in multiple sectors, including in higher education. How can non-HBCUs provide more welcoming and supportive educational experiences for black women here in Northeast Ohio? So that is a, a, a question which uh, should, should be raised probably by a whole range of colleges, right? Not just, although Cleveland may be at lowest rank, it's, it's a pervasive problem that black women and men, for that matter, come to predominantly white colleges and do not feel welcome. And even some predominantly white colleges that call themselves majority-serving institutions, because if you have a, you have 25% of your population is black and Latino, you can call yourself a majority-serving institution. There has, what distinguishes HBCUs is that their mission is to do what it takes for their students to succeed. That is not the mission of majority serving institutions. Until majority serving institutions take that up as their mission, I don't know what to tell them. I, I, I don't know what to tell an institution that, that doesn't say, I want to make sure my students succeed. And if you don't want to see all of your students succeed, you're always going to have that problem. And so I can, and I, and I, I, was, at, I was at New York University for 23 years. Was, so that's definitely a, major, um, uh, um, a, maj, uh, a predominantly white, and so I get all the acronyms mixed up, the predominantly white institution, a, P, a, a PWI. And we used to get that complaint that you know, our black students, our Latino students, our Asian students didn't feel like they were getting the, the attention. And I would tell my faculty, look, there's nothing magic about this. You walk into a classroom, you look around at your classroom, you look at everybody in the classroom, and you have to say to yourself, what can I do to make that student succeed? If you're not saying to that, I don't know what else, we can do all these other little things around the fringes. But the honest answer is people have to want to see everyone succeed. And that's the most honest answer I can give. Good afternoon, Dr. Campbell. Anthony Brown from the United Negro College Fund. Always a pleasure to see you. Hello. What, from your lens as a president of the institution, again, share with our audience, uh, the importance of how alumni and alumnae, let me be respectful for I, my Spelman alums in the room, <laughs> and community supporters to support students to advance to and through an HBCU such as Spelman or any of our other member institutions. So I, I think um, for the alums in particular, I, I, I really do believe in what we call history and traditions. And, and um, pe people tend to, you know, poo-poo that, well, you know, that's, that's old-fashioned. No, it's not. Our, 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 our history and traditions remind us of the continuity the, and, and the fact that we have prevailed all these years. That was not easy. And so we have these, we have these traditions, and I'll tell you one that, that just moves me to tears every single year 
is Spellman has a departing ceremony. So, so at the time that, so parents will go home, right? So at the time that you know, they bring their students to, to, you know, to, and deposit them for first year, um, we have a formal ceremony that says, okay, students go over here and the parents will say goodbye to them, right? Every year, they call up the students who came to campus by themselves. They don't have their mother, their father, no aunt, uncle. They had to maybe come from California, maybe from Cleveland to get to, to Atlanta, Georgia. They're by themselves. And they come up, and the alums come up and encircle them and put their arms around them. It is so powerful. And they're saying to them, you belong here, and you're now part of a new community, the Spellman Sisterhood, and we are going to be here for you. About a week after that ceremony, we have the induction ceremony, and that's when the alums come, and there are usually about 150 alums who come dressed in their white attire, which is featured in the Ralph Lauren, right? <laughs> dressed in their white attire, and all the first-year students are dressed in their white attire, and they come up to the front of Sisters Chapel, and they each one gets pinned by an alumna. And again, it's another statement of uh, we belong. Those are important. It is important to participate in them, to be a part of them, to, to be, because that, that solidarity, that connection, that continuity, that's important. That means something for us and for our, our community. Um, this, the second thing is, you know, I said we have, we have a, a program called Sister to Sister, about 150 alums who are formally assigned to students, usually juniors and seniors, to mentor them. So we get attorneys, we get doctors, we get people in corporate, uh, the corporate world who give students some real insights into what they're going to be facing and how they should be prepared and, you know, how they, you know. And, and, and from that, a lot of meaningful, deep relationships come out. So if you're, you know, if you have those kinds of opportunities, definitely participate. And then there's fundraising. So we have this thing, one, one, of the, one of the best programs we've ever had is something called 25 at 25. So Spelman has a, had a very quaint technology infrastructure, I'll say that. Uh, we, we're still using Lotus Notes for email, okay. <laughs> And uh, we, we realized we, we can't, the young, to the young lady's point who asked about 21st century, you can't compete if you don't have an, an, an up-to-date technology infrastructure, right? This was a group of, of uh, two or three alums who went out and got 25 of their colleagues to give $5,000 a year, which is $25,000, at 25 at 25. And they, the intent was to raise a million dollars. I think they would raise like a, a million two or something like that for our technology fund, which we are, and that was like three years ago maybe, four, we're still using that. That is still critical funding when we don't, we, we, you know, we get money from the feds, we get some private money, and then when we, when we need, need to fill a gap, we go into that technology fund. So there, there was another <laughs> instance where uh, Golden Girls uh, got together and played bridge for money, and however much money they raised, they donated to spot. I mean, there are all kinds of wonderful ways to do it, to have fun and to do it, and to, but alums should, should find a way to, to give back. And so those are, those are some of the time and treasure ways to give back. Thank you. Unfortunately, I think we are all oh, no. out of time. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and conclude. Okay. Today at the City Club, we have been talking with Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell, president of Spelman College, as part of the City Club's Education Innovation Series in partnership with Nordson. Today's forum is also made possible thanks to the African American Philanthropy Committee at the Cleveland Foundation. We also would like to welcome guests at tables hosted by Central State University, the Cleveland Foundation, Cuyahoga Community College, Nordson, St. Martin de Porras High School. Thank you all for being with us today. 
Next week, the City Club will be back at the Happy Dog on Wednesday, April 6th, talking about the confirmation hearings for Katanji Brown Jackson, mm -hmm. the future of the Supreme Court, and its influence in the current era of politics. Then coming up on Friday, April 8th, former State Senator Nina Turner will be here talking about her second run for Ohio's 11th District. It is part of a series of forums leading up to the primary election on May 3rd. You can buy tickets and learn more about these forums at cityclub.org. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, President Campbell. It's thank been you. a pleasure. And Spelman College for being here with us. And thank you, members and friends of the City Club. I'm Jenny Hamill, education reporter with 89.7 WKSU Ideastream Public Media. The forum is now adjourned. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.